Hello, my name is Daryl Robert Schoon, and on this program of Dollars and Cents, I want to put this um, unfolding crisis in a context that will give you some perspective on the changes that you are involved in. I know that each one of us is dealing with the changes now on a personal level. And at times we may feel overwhelmed or, and not understand really what's going on. But today, I hope at the end of this program, you will have a different sense of what is going on and the role you are going to play in this. Now, much of what I'm going to talk about today comes from a book called The Great Wave. This was published in 1996 by Oxford University Press. It is a, a very well-researched book, and it's by Professor David Hackett Fisher. Now, what Professor Fisher did was he's an economic historian, and he went back and he looked at these various stages of history, all right? And what he found out was there were periods of stability. And between these different periods of stability, and, and we gave these periods names, all right? Uh, for example, the Middle Ages, that was a, one of the periods of stability. The next period that we gave a name to was the Renaissance. It was, so we would say, well, the Middle Ages was, was succeeded by the Renaissance. And then historians would say, well, the Renaissance was succeeded by the Age of Enlightenment. All right. And then the next hist historical epoch in Western Europe, in, in the Western world, was uh, this, the Age of Enlightenment was, was succeeded then by what he calls the Age of Vic Victorian Stability. Now, what Professor Fisher said was, was that these are different ages. But what he noticed was between each of these different ages was an intervening period, a period that he called price revolutions. And he called this because what described, what was common to each one of these periods was a revolution in the price structure. What Professor Fisher said was that these areas of stability were each interrupted by an intervening era, even perhaps longer than the eras themselves, that would change these eras, raise them to a height, and then drop them, as it were, on their face. At the end of each period of price revolution, the preceding era was gone. The societal structure, the cultural beliefs, the foundation, what characterized the previous era at the end of each price revolution was over, which lay the groundwork for the new succeeding era. So what happened to the feudal, to the medieval era, the Middle Ages, a price revolution intervened. Prices began to rise, things began to happen, and for a period of anywhere between 80 and 160 years, that's how long these price revolutions would last, that era would describe the price revolution at the end of that, the previous era, the Middle Ages, was gone. The world that had been known was over. To be succeeded by another world that Professor Fisher said was of a higher nature, a higher quality. It's as if the snake would shed its skin periodically and each succeeding skin would be more beautiful than the skin before, but each period of shedding shared with the previous period of shedding certain characteristics. Now, what Professor Fisher said is that we are now in a like period of shedding. We are in another price revolution. We are in another era that is bringing to what was true before to an end to prepare the way for what is to come. Now, Professor Fisher said this last price revolution began in 1896. All right, 1896. So we are approximately 115, 120 years into this new, rev into this price revolution. And, but what he said about this present era is the amplitude of change is greater than in any preceding price revolution. So what he said is, essentially, is that the dynamics 
and the consequences and the magnitude of change that we are presently undergoing is greater than in, in any previous era that he kept data for, that he, that, he, that he went and analyzed. So this era of change that we are in is very, very consequential. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the last period of change, and the previous price revolution, and I think you're, to show you the similarities between what is happening now and what happened then. What he said was, the price revolution of the preceding one, he calls the, the price revolution of the 18th century. All right? What we really are in is now the price revolution of the 19th century and, and more, the 20th century. All right? Because the, this current price revolution started in 1896, it has taken completely the 1900s, which is the 20th century, and we are now in the 21st century, where the price revolution of the 20th century is cresting, is cresting in one final ascent before it brings the present era to a close. Now, I am going to describe to you what happened in the previous right price revolution, the price revolution of the 18th century. And this is what he said. Once began, prices started rising. All right? And the most rapid movements occurred in the price of energy and food. So we have in the 1700s, this is the price revolution of the 18th century, the price of food and fuel began rising. All right? Now he said most of the people at the time didn't notice it in its early stages. They still thought it was stable. But as time moved, as we got deeper into the price revolution, Right, the fact that prices were rising began taking on a life of their own and, be, and people began noticing this. Now, what happened this was, he said, the prime mover of this price revolution was the increasing pressure of aggregate demand. Now, what that means is, is that the summation of demand, of supply and demand, supply and demand are your basic fundamentals, but when demand starts rising, it forces prices to rise also. So as aggregate demand rose in the 1700s, prices began rising also. Now, here we are in the 21st century, and aggregate demand is also rising. Now, why? We do have population growth, and it's been rising steadily and increasing. But on top of this increasing uh, 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 de demographic growth of population, we have the largest nation on the face of the earth, China, entering into the industrial age, the rapid industrialization of China has now added an extraordinary amount of aggregate demand onto the global economy. I was in China in 1976. At that time, most people were riding bicycles. All right? I remember being on the streets of Shanghai and seeing camels coming into the city, all right, pulling things. This is what China was only 35, 40 years ago. Now they have Porsches. Now they, they're, they're, they have uh, traffic. Uh, I mean, they have the same kind of traffic um, overwhelm that we have in the United States. So what you have then is the introduction of industrialization to the greatest population, to the largest population on earth, adding to the aggregate demand that is now happening. One of the reasons why fuel costs so much is because of this added pressure from the rapid industrialization of China. All right? Now, and as the Chinese move into this industrialized society, they too are beginning to eat more meat. This is putting upward pressure on both grains that feed livestock and on the meat themselves. So when Professor Fisher talked about rising prices in the price revolution of the 18th century, we can see the same things happening here in what we could call the price revolution of the 20th century. Now what happened after this when prices began to rise? All right. 
we saw there was an inflationary psychology begin happening. Okay? Now, what he says happened, this is during the 18th century, when they realized that there was pressure on supply, what happened was this. Governments and individuals responded to this discovery of increased demand much as they had done in earlier price revolutions, in earlier price waves. As prices rose, pressures mounted for monetary expansion. This is in the 1800s. What happened as demand rose, governments responded with monetary expansion, hoping to keep prices stable. All right? In this relationship, the quantity of money and the velocity of its circulation was not in, in, an independent variable. In the face of rising prices, deliberate efforts were made to expand money in circulation. This happened during the 1700s, the 18th century. This also happened in the, 19th in the 20th century. The increase in the money supply, which we saw and thought it was an independent event happening, Professor Fisher said this is exactly what happened in the previous era of a price revolution. We were treading the same path, we were doing the same thing as, as happened 200 years before when a similar price revolution upended that present society of Europe. You had aggregate demand increasing, you had a response of government to expand the money supply to take care of that demand in, uh, that was increasing. Now, what happened is our response was no more effective in the 20th century than it was in the 18th. Even though the money began circulating at a faster rate, governments responded to the price revolution of the 18th century with various fiscal expedients that were also inflationary. <laughs> now, what Professor Fisher is talking about is what happened in the 1700s. And I want to quote his exact words. As public spending tended to exceed income, the gap was filled with borrowing on a heroic scale. <laughs> now, I thought that our borrowing is extraordinary on a historic level. And truly it is. But the historic level that I was thinking of <coughs> was only a small time frame. Professor Fisher stepped back in history and saw that in the 1700s, governments did the same thing, borrowing on a historic scale. All right? Another common thread running through these two eras. Now, what he then said was happened during the 1700s, as the price revolution continued, the rich and powerful generally did well for themselves. <laughs> now, uh, if you've been reading the newspaper lately, you are seeing that we have this huge disparity, this wealth gap that we're calling it, the 1% and the rest of us. All right? This also happened during the 18th century and the 1700s. The wealthy were doing quite well. Now, while he said was this, while rent kept up with inflation, so the people who were renting the properties were making money, wages fell behind. Wages tended to increase a little, but not, did not keep up with the rise in the price of goods, with commodities. Okay? This trend appeared in England, France, Germany, Austria, Poland, and Denmark during the 18th century. And it was the case both for laborers in Western Europe and serfs in Eastern Europe. So during that previous price revolution, we had a growing wealth gap between those at the top and those at the bottom. And as the price revolution went and continued, those at the top started to do far better than the those at the bottom. Now, 
The result of this decline in real wages in the 18th century was different from earlier price revolutions. Although it caused much suffering among the poor, no epidemic famines happened as in the 14th century and no decline of population as in the 17th. Here is a striking paradox in what happened in the price revolution. In the previous price revolutions, before the 18th century, people died. Famine, the cost of food was so great that the wealthy were able to live and those at the bottom died from starvation. What David Hackett Fisher said made the 18th century revolution different than the previous revolution is that there were no deaths from food shortages. And this is what he said it was why. He said, it was the growth of welfare, however limited at the time, to help prevent starvation. During, the seven, during this period of what he called the Age of Enlightenment, it was the first time governments had safety nets. Governments made an attempt to help the most vulnerable and the least able to take care of themselves from dying. And what Hackett Fisher said, David Hackett Fisher said, was that the previous price revolution, the 18th century price revolution, did not end in the widespread deaths that had happened in the previous price revolutions that were just as draconian, that were just as severe. But we saw the rise of safety nets that kept this tragedy from reaching the epic proportions that it had before. Now, what happened later was as this revolution, as the price revolution accelerated, prices started rising even more rapidly. All right? And individuals and governments tried to cope in various ways. Now, one of the greatest events that happened here was the rise in what he called inequality during this period of time. For the rich, this was the best of times, an age when the lives of the privileged few were marked by what Talleyrand called the douceur de vie, the sweetness of life. <laughs> ah, the sweetness of life. The wealthy had access to what we now see as private jets, the resorts around the world where they, the few would go, all right? And a period when the laborers, when the working man were going further and further down, the rich were having it the life of sweetness, okay? Now, here we are, the 1% is living better than they ever have. If you watched any of the graphs, in the last few years, their proportion of wealth on this planet has increased. And the proportion of wealth that held by the rest has gone down. So we see, I mean, no one has had the balls to call it the sweetness of life, but I want to tell you something. Those boys ain't suffering. Neither are their wives and neither are their kids, all right? They're, they are going to schools, private schools in New York, which cost them twenty dollars to $30,000 for the kids to go to grammar school, all right? They don't need student loans to go to these schools. These people are still living in those mansions in Connecticut and upper state New York, all right? And the poor, the ones who are working at the working poor, because most of the poor, much of the poor are now, they have jobs. They just can't live off their wages. All right? So we have in the 21st century, just as we had in the 18th, this huge disparity, this growing disparity between the rich and the poor. Now, I, I, the sweetness of life. All right? Now, but it wasn't those enjoying the sweetness of life that led to the next stage of the price revolution. What was the next stage of the price revolution was this.
The growth of inequality was an international trend in the late 18th century. It appeared in Europe, Great Britain, and even in the new United States. Inequality created material strains within society. As poor families devoted more of their income to bread, less remained for other things. The result was a shrinkage of demand, a collapse in demand, which is happening today. Governments caught in a spiral of increasing instability struggled to maintain their solvency by raising taxes, as Britain did throughout its empire in 1763 to, 1775, to 1763 to 1775, and France attempted to do in 1783 to 1788. Entrenched elites were able to shift these burdens away from themselves. The new taxes, like the old ones, fell heavily on those who were least able to bear them. Sort of sounds like today. Governments are forced to raise taxes. In the, in the last 10 years, what they did was they cut taxes for the rich, leaving the country the less fortunate to bear the tax burden. And right now, as 2012 ends, we're having, quote, a debate. A debate. Whether those who have recently been able to invest themselves of their, quote, onerous tax burden and shifted it to the country should resume the tax burdens that they had before the last few years. All right? Now, I just noticed something here. Britain started raising their taxes in 1763 to 1775 throughout their empire. The empire, the British Empire at that time, in 1775, included the crown colonies in America. So from 1763 to 1775, the British, caught by this wave of rising prices, higher costs, fiscal instability, tried to achieve some governmental stability by extracting more wealth from their colonies around the world, one of which was the United States of America, about to be. In 1775, there was no United States of America. In 1775, there were the crown colonies in America. The attempt, the need of Great Britain to extract wealth, to balance its budget, was what pushed the United States into revolution, into warfare, into bloodshed, and into rebellion. At the end of every price revolution, governments fall. This is what Professor Hackett Fisher pointed out. He pointed out that the, United, that the crown colonies in America were only the first to declare their independence. He pointed out that in England itself, there were riots during this period. In France, they overthrew the monarchy. In other countries, they began to fall. We are now in a like period of the next price revolution. We are in the price revolution that began in 1896. The same pressures are going on. And I think that when you see what happened in the 18th century as brought to us by Professor Fisher, you can see these same dynamics going on in around us right now. You and I are here at a similar time, in a similar period of a similar price revolution, except this price revolution is even bigger than anyone that preceded it. We are here in a momentous times. We are here in a time of great change when previous structures brought down previous governments. This program is part two of, it continues where I started on my last program. Now, <laughs> from the emails or the comments, uh, some of you have noticed that we are not releasing these videos on dollars and cents in order. And that's for our own reasons. Um, 
The last show, in fact, um, I think Coming to Collapse that you just saw released in December of 2012 was actually shot in December 2011. But I don't think it suffered from any loss of timeliness. If anything, it was even more timely a year later than we first shot it. But this program that um, you're about to see is part two uh, of the earlier program where I discussed David Hackett Fisher's analysis of what he calls price revolutions, these periods of, that bring eras to an end, these periods of intervening, rising prices, societal uh, chaos, uh, economic pressures that effectively wipe out the previous era so another era can begin in its wake. Now. Um, in the last program in part one, and I do suggest that for those of you who are watching this program first, you might want to go back and um, go to our program and, and find part one to watch it, um, to watch it before you this, because it sort of sets the tone for this. But I'll try and recapitulate in the next few, in the next few moments uh, what I did talk about in, 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 in part one. And in part one, uh, uh, Dr. Fisher, Professor Fisher described the events in the 1700s that were going on. The 1700s was a price revolution of a like period just like today, where prices started rising, where aggregate demand increased, where the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and um, what he pointed out was this price revolution was different than pre previous price revolutions because at least the poor didn't, didn't die from starvation as they had from the previous ones because at this time there were safety nets put into place. And what uh, Professor Fisher talked about was that each price revolution would end with a higher, with a, with a better world. And that's what I really want to say, you know, and I said this in the one I, I did before, that, that I, I'm very optimistic that at the end of this collapse, and we are going through a collapse and it isn't over, we're just part way through the process, all right? But we are in the last stage where that price, where that collapse reaches a wave before it comes down. That's where we are today in the, in the last month of 2012. We are in the end of the current price revolution. We're in stage four, all right? But we're not, we're not done with it yet. And in this last stage, things reach a, 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 a peak before they collapse and the next change happens. Now, in part one, I talked about the previous 18th century price revolution as described by Professor Fisher. And where we got to was in 1776 to 1775, the British Empire, to try and reach some sort of stability because their rising expenses, tried to extract more wealth from their, crown, from their colonies around the world, one of which was the, was the crown colonies of America. All right? This pressure on the crown call exerted on the American colonies triggered what we know now to be the American Revolution. The Boston Tea Party, the revolt against the tea tax, was only the la last in a series of attempts by England to extract more money from its overseas colonies to balance its deficit spending. All right? This, however, provided the trigger for the American colonies to revolt. Now, this is why in the extraordinary constitution that the Founding Fathers wrote that they put in there that the right of all Americans among those rights was the right to bear arms. This is the genesis, this is the raison d'etre of why this was encoded in the Constitution of the United States. You have to realize that the United States government was written not by those who have enjoyed power to rule with power over others. It was written by rebels. It was written by a group of people who had overthrown the yoke of tyranny to establish their own freedom. And that's why they put into that Constitution that Americans would forever have the right to bear arms in case of previous tyrannies, in case of tyrannies to come, where Americans would have the wherewithal to buy if necessity to revert to armed 
insurrection to take back their government. This was in the Constitution of the United States in 1776. This is 2012. And I would like to say something about guns, freedom, and fear. In the previous program, I showed where in the 18th century, change had happened and it reached a fever pitch. So by the 1775, 1776, revolutions began happening through the world like popcorn. Boom, 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 boom. And if we think the American Revolution was revolutionary, and it was, the French Revolution that followed was just as revolutionary. For it brought to end a monarchy, the rule of kings and queens that had reigned for centuries on that land and they knew no other form of rule except monarchical. Now, what I want to say is this insurrection against ty tyrannical power, all right, which is reserved to the people of the United States by the founding fathers. I want to tell you something. We are just in need of a return to our original values. But I want to say that in my opinion, guns ain't going to do it. Now this may come as a shock to all you good Americans that have salted away ammo in your cellars, that have your guns racked up, and maybe when you watch the evening news and talk with your friends, you say, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. They ain't going to do it to us. We're going to stop them at the door. Well, if you haven't noticed, they're prepared. If you haven't noticed what they've done to the Occupy movement, it's a warning. It's a warning to America. Those peaceful protesters at the University of California, Davis, sitting there protesting against economic inequality in a peaceful protest, sitting down, holding hands, were subjected to pepper spray by policemen walking in front of them to Americans peacefully protesting, subjecting them to pepper spray. And if you haven't been watching the news in the last year of what they did to the Occupy encampments in New York and in your local towns where they use police force to stop any, any protest against the egregious inequality that's happened in our country. That's a sign of what they're prepared to do. They're itching. They're waiting. They're waiting because they expect Americans to respond somehow. <laughs> but you know what? Most of you guys with your stashes of guns, you don't have the balls to even think you're going to go after the government. You've got those guns because you think it's the minorities down the street that are going to take your SUV away from you. We are, again, at the edge of tremendous change. We are living in another period of change as intense as the American Revolution. Strauss and Howe wrote a book called The Fourth Turning in 1996. And they said these periods of change come to America periodically. There have been three such like periods of change. The first period of change was the Revolutionary War. The second period of deep change, the second turning, was the Civil War. These periods of change happened between 70 and 80 years. So you had 1776, you had the Revolutionary War in, what was it, 1860? 
And then he said, the next turning, the next deep crisis to affect America was the twin tragedies, the twin crises of the Great Depression and World War II. And then in 1996, they wrote in their book, another turning is up ahead. The fourth turning is coming. And they said, around 2005, a crisis will beset the land. There will be civil unrest, economic hardship, and for the next 15 to 20 years, America will enter another gate of change during that period. We are in that period. They said, like previous periods of intense change, it could result in war, armed insurrection, civil disorder, and a breakup of the United States itself is possible. This was threatened during the Civil War. Texas is talking publicly about doing it again. This is what we're up against. But I want to say that guns aren't going to work this time. They were necessary in 1776. A ragtag bunch of colonists took on the greatest power in the world and won. But now America is facing another deep set of change. The government itself has become a virtual police state. The United States of America has four to five times the percentage of its population in prison than in any other country on the face of the earth. The police state in America is here. And all you guys with your gun stashes thinking that you're going to protect your liberty against a tyranny didn't even notice when it was here because it was happening to somebody else. But we are under and we are entering a period of societal change that is going to be as revolutionary as the one that produced this country in the first place. But it's not by guns this revolution is going to be accomplished. It is not by violence. It is a change of consciousness. Strauss and House said that when this fourth turning happened, a period of regret will overtake America for what it has done. That regret has not yet happened. But it is going to. America is going to take stock of what it has become. America is going to look at what happened to it in the past 50 years. America is going to look in the mirror and see what it what the part that it played in the troubles that have now beset it. Previous to this period of time, commies were blamed, women, hippies, socialists, and yet the core, the core was rotten. For those of you who want to go and look at some history or look in the mirror, you might want to Google Prescott Bush, Smedley Butler, and FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. There was treason, and there is treason in this country. There have been attempts to overthrow the government of the United States by armed force that have happened in our history. And the greatest one of these happened in 1933 when Prescott Bush, the grandfather of George Bush, and other American industrialists engaged in a conspiracy to raise a private army to overthrow the government of the United States of America. This plot was discovered when they approached Smedley Butler 
who at the time was a war hero for America. Smedley Butler was the greatest decorated Marine of all times. And they approached Smedley Butler, Major General Smedley Butler, to do this on their behalf. But he was more of an American than they realized. Instead of doing as they wished, he went to the U.S. government and told them of what had happened. Congress investigated his charges. They found out they were true. They called the offending parties before them and then did nothing. They did nothing. A conspiracy for a, an act, for something to qualify as a conspiracy, what you need are two things. Collusion among parties to act in a certain way and treason is such an act. Treason, the collusive coming together of individuals and groups to overthrow the government of the United States of America. And one overt act. In this case, the legal foundation for treason, the legal foundation for conspiracy were both met. The bar is set high and it was met and nothing was done. Nothing was done by the United States because the people who were going to set in motion an armed insurrection against the government of the United States. The last time that it happened was a civil war. They didn't even go. The South did not even engage in armed insurrection. The South merely succeeded from the Union. And it was the North that set in motion their armies to end the succession in the 1860s. In the 1930s, in the next great turning, the third turning, as pointed out by Strauss and Howe, there was an attempt by powerful elites in the United States to overthrow the United, government of the United States. There was an intention, there were acts which qualify as a conspiracy which qualify as treason. But because these people were so powerful, nothing ever was done to them. Never was written down in your history books. Congress tried to ignore what it had found out. Why? Because it was one of them. It was one of America's elite, powerful industrial groups that wanted to overthrow the government. Instead, maybe to expiate their guilt, their shame, they hung a couple of Italians named Sacco and Vanzetti in Chicago. Socialists for saying that the American system needed to be changed. Sacco and Vanzetti had no army. Sacco and Vanzetti had no money. Sacco and Vanzetti they just had a sense of injustice. And yet, when brought before the United States Supreme Court, Judge Learned Hand, oh, I gotta love American jurisprudence. When their defense was freedom of speech, Learned Hand said those great words that have echoed through American jurisprudence since that time. That freedom of speech isn't unqualified. That to call fire in a crowded theater is not protected by the right to freedom of speech.
And yet, the right of the wealthy to engage in an act of conspiracy to overthrow the government of the United States is ignored by the American court system. We are not yet at a period of introspection. We are not yet at a period of looking at who this country really is and what it has done. We are not yet at a point of seeing how far we have strayed from the intentions of our founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson said, I cannot conceive of any man who would receive pleasure from his power over another human being. And yet, we are in Afghanistan. We've been in Iraq. We are in the Philippines. We are in Nicaragua. We are in Cuba. Smedley Butler later wrote a book and he said, I was an armed thug for the United States economic interest. The most highly decorated Marine in the history of the United States looked back on his storied career and he said, I was a thug for American industrialists. We have not yet, America as a nation, nor have we as individuals, looked back upon how we have betrayed the intention, the dreams of the Founding Fathers. These were great men. These were not ignorant fools. They knew human nature. Benjamin Franklin once said, I agree. I put my name to this Constitution. Not that it is the best and perfect document, but that it is the best we can come up with at this time. He said, I do so knowing that someday the American government will become a tyranny. I do so knowing that someday the American people are going to get the government ultimately they will deserve at that time. Benjamin Franklin knew that the American Revolution was an anomaly. Benjamin Franklin knew that it was a revolution before its time. James Madison, another signer of the Declaration of Independence said, I give democracy a generation, a generation and a half at best. Because in the end, democracy has always destroyed itself. This is not to say that ruled by monarchy, ruled by fiat, ruled by ideological religious elites is better than democratic rule. This is to say, as I have said in my writings, until human nature changes, history will not. We are at another moment in American history. We are at another turning. I have faith, though it is not yet evidenced by fact, that this time we will rise to the occasion and America will become again the America its founding fathers saw in their mind's eye.